this is going to be a fun conversation because everybody loves food, right? This is like easy. We don't have you know, issues with people using our product because we all eat. So Dominic, you founded the company with some co-founders in 2011. For those folks not familiar with this kind of product or HelloFresh, quickly give us an overview of what the company does. Yeah, so HelloFresh is all about meals. So basically, what we do is if you sign up for HelloFresh, we publish a menu of 10 recipes each week. You pick the three you like best, and what we do is then go out to our suppliers, go out to farmers, source all the ingredients, pre-portion it, and ship it right to your door. Yep. So basically, you get everything you have, and then within 30 minutes, you can cook a great, delicious meal from scratch. So I spoke with many of you guys uh, earlier today about, since many of you guys are HelloFresh customers, just to kind of get your experience. And we'll be sure to ask Dominique some of those questions. But additionally, we'll get into some other bigger questions, like uh, what does this mean for, for larger grocery companies? And are these guys truly a threat? And how he sees potentially you know, taking down those guys, right? Uh, if that's on the roadmap. He's also got some interesting new product updates, which we'll certainly touch on. And additionally, we'll talk about the overall market in terms of how much food he's moving, how many meals he's moving. And we'll really get into all of that. So take us back. Back to, to year one, 2011, what was kind of total number of meals shipped over that entire first year? Do you remember? I do. Um, I think in the very first year, we shipped about 400,000 meals over the span of 12 months. And this was strictly in what market? That was back then, that was in uh, Germany, in uh, the UK, in the Netherlands. Those were kind of like our European core markets when we got started. And then about three and a half years ago, we actually expanded to the US. And we actually um, launched in the US sort of like three and a half years ago and really scaled up ever since. So about 2015-ish, you launched in the US market. In just the US market in year one, same question, what was total volume of meals moved? First year in the US should have been something like a million, a million and a half meals. And then take us forward to today. What is that number? So today, we, so last year, we did about 90 million meals per month. This year, last month, we did about 11 million meals per month. So basically still experiencing like super, super high growth and um, hopefully making a lot of Americans happy. That's a lot of food, right? 11 million meals per month. Wonderful things. And that's across all your markets, correct? US, international, everywhere. Exactly, exactly. And just to visualize that, so um, one meal is about, in terms of weight, it's about two pounds. So basically, the amount of food that we're really processing each month is really about 22 million pounds of food that goes through our hands. And describe, so, so let's talk a bit about, about how a company, and let's be specific, Whole Foods, right? So describe how they think about delivering food and food experiences to their customers relative to how you're thinking about it at HelloFresh. Yeah, good question. Um, I think the, the biggest difference is really if you look at classic grocer, grocers, what they do is basically they are connected to all those manufacturers, to all the big brands, right? And they basically ship the goods, they, they kind of like um, ship the goods out to different locations all across the country, and then wait for customers to pick them up. They have a huge universe of SKUs, a huge universe of goods that they sell, on average 30,000 to 50,000 in a single supermarket. Um, whereas what we do is actually we start with the customer, we know where the demand is, only when we know how many meals we're gonna send out, that's when we go out to our suppliers. That's when we source everything in the right quantities. And that basically means that not only do we have much, much less SKUs, so about 100 compared to 30,000, but we also basically buy huge volumes of those 100s, thus benefiting basically from economies of scale. Um, and we only buy what we already know that the customer wants. Mm -hmm. Now, if anyone right now is on their computer, opens their phone and opens up the HelloFresh app, they'll see kind of meals this week that you've curated. Now, the week's not over, so you've already kind of curated these meals, so you must have some kind of method to predicting demand to some degree. Walk us through the algorithm or, or how you do that. Yeah, so first and foremost, I guess HelloFresh is, uh, is a tech company. So no matter whether we talk about procurement, whether we talk about demand forecasting, all of that really rests on the algorithms that we have and on the data that we generate and that we use to actually predict demand. Mm -hmm. So what that really means is basically, I don't know if you as a customer will get meals next week, but given I have so much data about past customers and so much data about how customers opt into meals um, and getting a delivery or not getting a delivery, I have a really, really high accuracy in predicting the demand that I have. So just to give you a concrete example, right? If I have 100 people that started their HelloFresh plan in January, mm -hmm. I have a pretty good idea how many of those will buy this month, how many of those will buy this week. Like I said, I don't know if you individually will buy, but given 
the amount of data that I have, I can, with a very, very high degree of accuracy, predict how many meals I will be shipping. So you've delivered, to kind of dive in those numbers a bit, you're delivering about 11 million meals per month, averaging about, call it, two pounds per meal. And how large is your entire kind of customer base? They've bought at least one meal over the course of you know, the HelloFresh lifetime. Um, so in terms of the customer base, we're having round about, so I think last numbers that we published were like 850,000 households mm -hmm. that were consuming HelloFresh meals. Some of them basically buy every week, others buy once per month, others buy once per quarter. In the end, what we try to do is make it as flexible as possible, right? If you want to have it every week, great, we love that. If you only want to have it every second week or every month, we're still happy for you to be customer. And then let's uh, kind of start comparing this to some of the ways that a company like Whole Foods would do food distribution in terms of costs, waste, and things like that, because you guys have some interesting advantages yeah. and maybe disadvantages there. Um, we understand how many meals you're shipping. What is the average price point? What is the average consumer going to pay for one meal? So in the US, it's a flat price. It's always $9.99 per meal. Um, in Europe, that's a little lower. It's basically in line with the food price indices. Mm -hmm. um, the way it works is really for us, is really for us, um, we have a very limited number of SKUs. Given that we only put 10 meals on the menu, each meal on average like 10 ingredients, something like that. So we have 100, 100 SKUs that we uh, source at a very, very, um, with a very, very um, big number, right? So we connect to all of those suppliers. We have about uh, a universe of 400, 500 suppliers, some of those farmers, some of those manufacturers, some artisans, others which are more distributors. And uh, given the volume that we need, we basically split out those volumes all across the different suppliers that we have. Number one, to basically get the best price. Number two, to de-risk everything. Um, but also very important to notice is basically that all of those suppliers that we have connected to our platform, that they've basically, you know, meet certain standards, have certain um, certifications, all of those things. That's what we basically, uh, that's what we basically do. So if I take an average price point of, of, of $9 kind of per plan in the US market, extrapolate that internationally, and you're delivering about 11 million meals basically per month, about $100 million in revenue per month, is that accurate? I can't comment on that. Is my math wrong? <laughs> um, the, the math is probably right, but um, there's like other effects at play which uh, might make that number higher or lower. So Got it, very good. That's pretty good, right? You know, you kind of get, get a little bit of wiggle room, right? Good. Um, Talk to me about waste. We, we chatted about this backstage a little bit. Now, I'm, I'm teeing you up here because you've told me this is an advantage for you guys. Walk yeah. me through what that advantage looks like. Yeah, so um, classic traditional food supply chain is you have certain suppliers, you have farmers, they sell to wholesale. Wholesale basically ships to a supermarket hub. Ship, supermarket hub ships to a, an individual supermarket where you as a consumer pick something up and take it home. So it basically goes through different pairs of hands. At each of those steps, you have a certain amount of waste that occurs naturally. How much? I would say probably like 3 to 5% at each of those steps. OK. Second thing is, um, if you look at how many things actually never get bought in a supermarket, it's quite astonishing. I think in Europe, it's about 10%, 12% of perishables that never get sold, that go back uh, bad before the expiration date. In the US, that number is even higher. In the US, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's between different sources, between 25 and 35%. And that you, you go see back. in a supermarket, especially, yes. They're, wait, they're thrown out. They don't go they're back They're thrown anywhere. out, especially. Yeah. They're, they're not sold to consumers. Yeah. If you, as a consumer, now buy something, obviously, it's priced in that they need to throw out a lot of stuff. So given that we start with the demand that everything that we buy, we already have sold, we only buy what we need, and we don't have that wastage component, right? So we basically have a 30% price advantage just by basically taking out that whole waste from the food supply chain. And that's a big, big advantage for us. Yeah, you have an interesting kind of process built around. You already just explained it, kind of the demand. When, when are you actually starting to hold inventory from the local farmer in New York based off your predicted demand for the, I don't know, vegetable salad, you know, I guess all salads are vegetable, but the salad, <laughs> the salad that's coming out on Friday, right? Yeah. Um, so the big advantage that we have, we sell plants. 
That means you, you can treat it as flexible as you want. You don't have to opt in. You don't have to basically you don't have to do anything if you don't if you only want to have one delivery. That's totally fine with us. But given the big data that we have and that we apply to our demand forecasting, we have a pretty good idea how much demand we need. When now, do you actually hold that inventory, though? Like we, we, we don't really hold inventory. Like okay. the sort of like what we get is we don't have warehouses. We don't run warehouses. Okay. What we run are basically manufacturing sites. So that means you have all the stuff going in on one side. We basically repack it. We um, manufacture some of that stuff. We pick and pack it into the different meal kits, mm -hmm. which then come into the boxes, and it goes out on the other side. The stuff in our, in our fulfillment centers, as we call them, or manufacturing sites, never sits in there longer than two or three days. That basically means we don't build up inventory. We're slightly front-loaded at the beginning of the week where we get more deliveries, yep. so we can basically match the demand pattern over the course of the week. And then until the end of the week, we basically pick to zero. End of the week, our whole distribution center is empty. 10 new meals come onto is the menu. Is it completely empty? What is your, you must be Pretty some much. waste. Um, our waste is under 1%. Okay, compared it. to about 30% in the sort of like classic traditional grocery market. Right, so you're passing those cost savings back to the consumer essentially, right? How do you, <laughs> or, or he has a big salary, right? <laughs> the money's going somewhere. Um, talking more about money, Whole Foods has a $10 billion market cap. Uh, you know, you could argue about other grocers and if they're doing not good or, or, or you know, they're doing well. Then you have companies like obviously Amazon Fresh, Uber Eats, some pri you know, smaller ones, Blue Apron, Plated. How do you beat these guys? And if so, uh, who do you see kind of as your biggest competition? Yeah, maybe I start with the, with the competition point sure. because certainly there are some direct competitors that also offer meal kits, but then there's basically a lot of indirect competitors, which is takeout spots, which is restaurants, casual restaurants, which is the supermarkets per se. Basically, when we ask our customers, right, before you ate HelloFresh, mm -hmm. which kind of meals are you now replacing with HelloFresh meals? Then basically the answer that we get in the US is um, for 10 HelloFresh meals, for six of those, I don't go to the supermarket anymore. Okay. For three of those, I do less takeout. And uh, basically, I also kind of like don't do one restaurant visit that I did before. Okay. So if you look at the basket of meals, it's sort of like 10 HelloFresh meals replace six, uh, six uh, meals that you would have bought at the supermarket, three takeouts, and one restaurant visit, which then mean that actually in terms of value for money, you're actually spending way, way less doing HelloFresh than basically you know, paying for those six supermarket, three takeout, one restaurant visit. Now, I spoke with many of the folks in the audience who some were HelloFresh customers, some were not, but the ones that I spoke with who were customers and I asked about their buying habits, one of the things they articulated, and obviously this is a biased audience, right? Um, and one, one lady said, I'm in New York. When I get off the subway, I know what I had for lunch, so I can just very quickly walk in the grocer, get my dinner, and walk home, and that's more efficient than waiting on a HelloFresh delivery. Is that your target customer? And if so, how do you win over that particular meal buy? So generally speaking, I think um, the core concept that we have appeals to a lot of different segments and audiences, right? So we have customers in New York City, but we have as many customers in Texas, in California, in middle America, et cetera. And I think basically, depending on where you are as a customer, there are different alternatives that you have. Mm -hmm. If you're outside New York, outside the Bay Area, then actually the sort of like um, on-demand options that you have are definitely not as much as in New York, right? So I think in the end, the way that we look at it is basically depending on where you sit, you have different alternatives. For your weeknight dinners, we believe that the sort of like things that we have on offer, great meals, great recipes, um, you know, cooking times under 30 minutes, really deliciously and gated re recipe development process, that those sort of like USPs, you can't find in a lot of other things. Where we basically over-index a little bit is always for people that have that certain predictability in their life, right? So if you've just, um, if you have two kids, um, if you know I'm going to be home at least three times, four times per week, and will be cooking, then I think our service is absolutely perfect. Yep. If you don't know whether you're going to be in town next week because you might be on a business trip or just your your social life is so busy, then you still might like HelloFresh every now and then, but you're probably not doing it every week. And we like both of those customers, and I think we can appeal to both of those customers, but they have different buying patterns. Yep. Um, answer me the other question about competition. Do you see this more, uh, you, know, you know, 
going against an Uber Eats, a plated, a Blue Apron, or are you more worried or thinking about how Amazon Fresh is, is doing uh, grocery delivery? So the, the framework that I, that I tend to apply, uh, apply when I look at competition is really to say, like, hey, in any given month, there are 20 weeknight dinners, so 20 dinners from like Monday to Thursday. That's where we, for our customers, are usually in the consideration set. That's where they actively 20 consider dinners, us. 20 me total meals between those days. 20 dinners, right, in a month? Oh, in the whole month. Yes. Got it, got it, got it. I thought you said Monday to Thursday. I wanted to make sure you're, no, no. you're, con so you're feeding one... people customers that I don't know about. So. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so basically, you know, about 20 weeknights per month. Got it. For which, for our customers, we are in the consideration set. Now, I think definitely our customers also kind of like look at other services that do similar things. But they very much also basically go to supermarkets, go to takeouts, et cetera. And we tend to look at the, at the overall universe of basically opportunities that any given customer or any given you know, um, person in our, in our target segment has. Yep. And that's really kind of like where we try to stay ahead of the competition, where we're basically you know, thinking, in terms of costs, how do we compare to the supermarket, how do we compare to takeout, how do we compare to restaurants, in terms of deliciousness, in terms of transparency, where your stuff comes from, in terms of welfare standards, etc. So across all those dimensions, we try to kind of like get a really good sense where do we stand mm -hmm. and why would people pick us over other things or where do we lose out at the moment. How much capital have you guys raised to date? Um, in total, around 350 million. And who's really kind of the biggest investor? So our investors include uh, Inside Venture Partners from New York. Um, we have Bailey Gifford. We have Rocket Internet. Um, we have a couple of smaller early stage guys, uh, Phenomen Ventures, Full Work uh, uh, Ventures, and a couple of others. Quickly touching on Rocket Internet. So Barclays recently reported in 2016, they're losing you know, $630 million lost. You can look at the stock price. Um, I want to understand to what degree that company is influencing you as an investor. In other words, a lot of folks are saying they've got to take something public here, right, to try and make up for some of these losses. Do you feel any kind of pressure to go public? I think we always have done and we always will do what we consider is best for the company. I think we have, you know, very strong management team, very strong founder team, speaking about my co-founders, about myself, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and um, I think, you know, we're fully in line with uh, the investors that we have. Rocket is one of them, is uh, certainly like a very good investor for us. They have invested in multiple rounds, so have others. I think um, in the end, like our, our investors will be happiest when there is the, the biggest outcome possible, yep. not the earliest outcome possible or something like that. So basically, the way we think about it is really to think about what drives long-term success. Um, and, you know, when we build a successful company, everybody will be happy. Last question, yes or no. John Mackey loves the company. He writes you in the thing here, a $4 billion check to buy the company. Do you sell? No. <laughs> there you guys have it. Dominic with HelloFresh delivering millions and millions of meals. Thank you so much.